Alrighty, hello folks. Uh, we're here talking uh, about 25% of risk uh, with myself, Matthew Ellison, founder of HDEO, and I'm joined by Ellie, who's a young person uh, from England. And we've got, uh, we're fortunate enough to have two genetic counselors with us, also from England. So we've got Bill and we've got Harriet, both working in Manchester. Um, so Ellie, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Ellie. I'm and I'm from the black country. Nice. And Bill and Harriet? Hi, yeah, I'm Bill. I'm, um, I've been a genetic counsellor for 12 years now in Manchester. And I'm Harriet, and I'm also a genetic counsellor. Not been working quite as long as Bill. Super. And Ellie, do you want to share your HD situation a little bit or how you came into kind of knowing about HD? And then we'll go. Yeah. So oh, um, basically, it was from my dad's side of the family. Um, it was my dad's mom, so my nan, um, who had got it stuff. Um, and from quite early on, I decided that like I knew that I would want to be tested. Um, and my auntie, who you've obviously met with before, Amy, she got tested when she was eighteen um, and had a positive result. Um, one of her main reasons for being tested was that she knew that in her future she would want to have children um, and that was the same for me I think obviously being a girl you feel like maternal and stuff and you sort of know that that's what you want to have in your future um, and obviously it can be passed down if you just have a child naturally so that was one of the main reasons for me wanting to know um, and the second reason was just really um, like just the not knowing was bothering me more than actually finding out um, so it was always something that I'd wanted to do, but obviously I knew that you couldn't tell you were like 18 or whatever. Um, I sort of spoke about it with my dad and my mom, um, and my dad was like just sort of buried his head in the sand, didn't want to get tested, um, made it very clear that he didn't want to get tested. Um, this was sort of a few years prior to me actually having the test. Um, so I sort of tried to convince him, my mom tried to convince him, um, but there was sort of no getting round really. Um, so on my 18th birthday, that's how eager I wanted to, I was to know, on my 18th birthday I went to the doctors to get referred. Um, that was in the January and I didn't get my results until the December. So it took about a year, um, well, just under a year in total for me to actually, like from start to finish to get referred and to actually get my results. Um, my dad knew that, that it was what I was doing um, and like he was supportive of me finding out obviously he knew that if I had a negative result that he still would be none the wiser to his result um, but if I had a positive result obviously that would mean that he did as well um, so he came to some of my appointments with me um, and I think it was my second appointment the genetic um council asked to like just have a little chat with my dad on um on their own just to sort of they could make sure that it wouldn't affect my dad too much if he did find out um obviously he didn't want to find out before so just sort of that sort of thing and then he came to my results test with me um so he was in the room when they gave us the results and obviously it was positive um so that meant that i got my result that day but also he got his um so that was a bit strange because it was sort of like a bit of like a double whammy. Like we sort of, and then obviously I've got a younger sister as well who's 14. So then the next sort of thing was like obviously the worry for her. Whereas if I would have got a negative result, that would have meant that we didn't have to worry about her, that she wouldn't have it. Um, and that maybe my dad didn't have it either. So it was, it was a hard day um, to be fair. Yeah, because it was lots of things in one, lots of emotions. Thank you, Ellie. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it is, I find it really, really difficult to understand what it must be like to go be in that situation, even though I've been through testing myself. Um, yeah. It was just standard, I would call standard HD risk, yeah. in the sense where I had just the 50, 50, 50 odds. Um, yeah. And I only really had to think about myself in that sense. Um, but with you being at 25% risk, it's you're also having to think about your your father and his risk. Yeah. 
I find it really, really, um, yeah, I think it's potentially harder than 50% risk, even though your odds are less of getting Huntington's in that sense. Yeah. But it seems like mentally that seems a harder thing to go through. Yeah, definitely was. Um, we both was like crying and upset and stuff. And we Both of us just felt really guilty. Like I felt guilty for obviously making my dad find out his results, even though if it was up to him, he didn't really want to. Um, and then he felt guilty for not getting tested earlier and like other stuff. So it was, it was hard. Like we both felt really bad. Um, on the other one and then I felt a bit guilty for like my sister because I was thinking before I got tested she was only at 25% risk whereas now me and my dad have both tested positive it means she's in the 50% category so yeah it, it, I think mentally it, not that it's worse but there was sort of a lot more components to think about if that makes sense you did yeah there's a, that, I think that's a good way to put it there's an extra bit to think about there yeah um, yeah, I think that's a good way to put it. Um, but we're throwing around a lot of 25 and 50% risk. So I just want to get in the genetic counselors and just kind of, can you guys kind of clarify for people, anyone watching what we're talking about with 50% and 25% risk and the, and the difference there. So how Ellie got to being 25% at risk. Yeah, absolutely. So basic being sort of genes, even like what are genes? So genes are just like instructions in the body. So we've got specific genes for specific jobs. And here in Huntington's disease, we're talking about the HD gene. So that's got a really important role in looking after um, our brain and our neurons and things like that. So we've all got the HD gene and we've all got two copies of it. And that's because you get one from your mum and one from your dad. And what we know is somebody with HD, one of their copies of that gene is expanded and that causes the condition. But they have a second copy, which is of a normal size. So when someone has a child, you don't pass on both of your copies of the HD gene, you pass on one or the other. So somebody with HD or with the expanded copy, we know they've got one copy that's expanded and one that's normal size. It's a 50-50 of which one they pass on to their child. So when we have a parent who's not been tested, but their parent had HD, we know there's a 50-50 of whether that parent has inherited the expanded copy. But we know that that parent doesn't pass on both copies to the child, they only pass on half of whatever they have. So when we meet somebody like Ellie, when you were first met in the clinic, when you have a parent who's not had testing, their risk is 50% and the child's risk, so Ellie's risk was half of that. So half of 50% is 25%. So that's how we get to that, that position with somebody like Ellie. So does, I think that, does that make sense for you guys here? <laughs> Hopefully that will make sense to others. It makes sense to me. <laughs> I don't know if it makes sense to everyone else, but we'll find out. Uh, but but yeah, it's, it is difficult to kind of explain it. That it's like, okay, so you've got a parent who's got this 50% risk, which is kind of standard for HD that you people have that 50% risk. Um, and then you've got parents who have children like Ellie, um, but the parents don't want to get tested. So they're still at 50% risk or haven't yet got tested. So therefore, we can say that Ellie is is twenty five percent at risk at that moment. I think from the genetic counselor's viewpoint, like, what is the is there a protocol for dealing with twenty five percent for Huntington's, and and what is generally that protocol that's meant to be followed? Uh, so shall I come in? Um, so the the short answer is Matt. Really, there isn't a hard and fast protocol. There's not a sort of set um, you know guide that 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 takes us through a 25% scenario, any different really to a 50% scenario. Everyone's different, everyone's an individual. Uh, so, so we obviously as genetic counselors want to explore a little bit about you know, their knowledge of HD, their background, what, you know, what it means to them and, uh, and see what the starting point is. Uh, as you probably know, there are sort of guidelines that we work with to try and make sure that we're doing that in the, in the most supportive and best way possible to, to take people through that process. 
uh, and that does cover a little bit around 25% risk. Um, so basically that, that kind of suggests that we should be cautious around that scenario because obviously as Ellie said you know the that feeling of there could be a double whammy that that feeling of, of two results in in one and um so is it there's no protocol but is it generally accepted that the genetic counselors will will speak to the to the parent who's also at 50 percent risk as well so that's certainly encouraged in the guidelines so that that's you know our starting point is that that would be seen as as best practice in a way you know that that's the ideal because obviously um you know we we a bit like someone at 50 percent risk you, you know you want them to have the information and the support going through that process yeah i was just going to come in there and say that a lot of the thinking around these scenarios is trying to come to a sort of a satisfactory solution for everybody that's involved so it's, it's never really a case of we need sort of um consent or the the you know the go-ahead from the parent who's at 50 percent risk it's not exactly that way that we're looking at it it's we're looking at it that which we're trying to make sure we're doing the we're making the fairest decision and we're not not to use too strong words but sort of not violating and um, one person's right over another uh, um ellie so it sounds like your father he obviously didn't want to get tested um but it seems like when you started getting tested he was happy for that to continue anyway and he was part of your process going through so i'm just wondering kind of like how that went with with you and your father as you were getting tested how his reactions were as you went along yeah i think like because like i say earlier that i've been on on not on to him about it but i'd like it was something that i brought up numerous times years and years before i actually come to the point of getting tested um so we sort of he knew that when i turned 18 that was going to be what i was doing um so it weren't like it was like one day I just told him and it was like out the blue. He'd, he'd give him a bit, a bit of time to know what I was going to do. And I'd always been very open um, about that with him. And then I suppose because the testing process, process took almost a year, again, that gave him like another set of time to sort of get his head around it a little bit. That's, that's really interesting. Um, I think my query um, is... And it's really for, for Bill and Harry is what happens if if somebody who's at 50 percent kind of says so like what if happened if Ellie's father had said actually no uh, I don't really want to know I don't want to be part of this uh, this I don't want to be part of Ellie's process here um, what would happen in that circumstance um, thankfully that is probably relatively unusual um, I think you know, fortunately, we we are more used to sort of that scenario which Ellie talks about, where you know, parent it maybe hasn't wanted to actively pursue themselves, but are kind of on board with that being their children, their child's decision. If we don't have that parent being involved, it does become a bit more of sort of this ethical um, dilemma, um, a bit of like what I was saying before that it's a lot to do with making sure it's. You know a fair decision and the, and the patient in front of us who's come forward saying they want testing it's a lot about we, we, we can't ignore them coming forward and saying this is the right time for me I feel ready for this information so then it, it does become this um, just taking the time to make sure we've considered the person who's not in the room so Ellie uh, going back to you and your story uh, I'm just wondering how it was then when you got told that you were positive in that genetic counsellor's room or wherever you were um, with your father with you how did that go down for you and, and your father um well it was me my dad my mom and my auntie in the room so there was um, a good support system there and um, she gave us the results um obviously there's a few tears and stuff um and then she just sort of said, like, is there anything you want to speak about now? Do you want to just sort of go away, digest the information and we'll get back in touch soon? Or you can get in touch with us. Um, went home, we ordered a pizza, <laughs> like, just chilled out and just sort of, like, 
let the information sink in. Because um, I think it takes a while. It was probably like, probably about six months later when we finally like, sort of properly took it in and sort of started thinking about it like a little bit more. We just sort of, it was close to Christmas as well. It was like two weeks before. So we just wanted to have a nice Christmas, just sort of forget about it for a couple of weeks, you know what I mean? And then sort of start thinking about it um, a little bit more. And how has it been, how have the conversations between you and your father been about you, you testing positive since you got your results? Um, I don't feel like that as, they were never like awkward in the first place, but they were a bit more of a strained conversation. Whereas now, because we both know our results, they're not really there because we know what the result is. So there's not as much like, not tension around it, but like, you know what I mean? Um, uh, thank you. Um, thank you. That's it. We're done. We're done. Uh, so, uh, Bill, Harriet, thank you very much for your insight. I really appreciate it. Uh, Ellie, huge thank you for coming on and sharing your story. I truly appreciate Thanks. it. And a real pleasure to meet you, Ellie. Um, um. I'll, I will message you afterwards as well, just to send you a little message, no worries. Uh, but thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to stop recording now anyway. Bye-bye. <laughs>